Hi, 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 everyone. Welcome. Um, excited for today's special panel. And in the meantime, you know the drill. Put your um, name in the chat box and organization. Um, and Aubrey's going to kick us off um, in a few minutes. Thank you for being here. Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you all to the nonprofit call. Thank you for joining us and welcome to our API Heritage Month panel discussion. My name is Aubrey Kersey and I'm the marketing specialist here at United Way and I'm a part of the DEI task force. I manage all of our social media channels and on Twitter we will be having a discussion about the API panel today so if you guys could comment on that we'd really appreciate it. And as far as the DEI task force we are so proud to put this on and celebrate all of the diverse people in our community and celebrate API Heritage Month. And also um, coming up in June is Juneteenth so if you have any recommendations of your favorite or black owned restaurants or anything. We really wanna highlight those restaurants during a Juneteenth post and celebrate those in our community. So if you guys can mention that in the chat or email me at opryc at uwsn.org, we would appreciate it. And I wanna thank Nicole Santero for joining us and hosting this panel for us. We appreciate you so much, Nicole. And we will be reflecting on the documentary series, PBS Asian Americans Breaking Through today. Um, Nicole, if you wanna take it away. Awesome, thank you so much, Aubrey, and thank you, United Way, for inviting me to moderate this panel as part of AAPI Heritage Month. Um, and it's good to see everyone here today uh, joining us for this really exciting and important discussion about Asian Americans. Um, as Aubrey said, I'm Nicole Santero. I am the Director of Communications for the UNLV School of Public Health, uh, but I'm also honored to sit on uh, the board of, of several community organizations, such as the Nevada Minority Health and Equity Coalition, as 
well as OCA Las Vegas, which is a local nonprofit focused on advocating for and empowering the Asian American and Pacific Islander community in Las Vegas. So um, again, thank you for being here with us today. Uh, as Aubrey mentioned, we definitely want this to be as interactive as possible. So to everyone here, feel free to use your Zoom emoji features as well as the chat box to share your thoughts. Um, and I know we'd love for you all to reflect on this question of, you know, what do we hope Southern Nevadans take away from AAPI Heritage Month? So feel free to use the chat box or tweet your response to United Way on Twitter um, with the Twitter handle at UWSN. Um, and so now let's let's get to our panelists. So today we're joined by three AAPI leaders in Southern Nevada. We have Sunny Venuya, Vita Lynn, and Erica Mosca. Um, so what we want to do is just go around this Zoom room and quickly learn more about the three of you. So uh, for, for the three, can you briefly tell us who you are and a little bit about your organizations? Um, and let's start with Sunny. There you go. Sorry about that. Good, af good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for having me here. I am the president of the Las Vegas Asian Chamber of Commerce. We have been here since 1986 serving the community, try to be the voice of the uh, business Asian business community through, uh, through different things such as legislation, uh, economic development, and community as well. Thank you so much again for having me. Thank you, Sunny. Um, Vita, we'll go to you. Sure. My name is Vida Lin, president and founder of the Asian Community Development Council. We are a, um, we work with the community. We give out free services. And um, if you go to my website, you will see what kind of service we have. Thank you. Thank you, Vida. Erica? Thank you so much, Nicole. Great to be with all of you here this afternoon. My name is Erica Mosca. I'm the founder and executive director of Leaders in Training. We support students to be the first in their family to graduate from college, but more importantly, to come back to the community as the leaders we need. We're over out in East Las Vegas on Lamb in Washington, and we're really excited. We'll be expanding next school year. So wonderful to be with all of you this afternoon. Awesome. Thank you all uh, for being here as our panelists today. So let's get straight into our questions. Um, so as the country's fastest growing racial group, Asian Americans have certainly played and are continuing to play an essential role in the future of America. Can each of you tell us a little bit about your experience growing up and living here in the U.S.? And, and if you are an immigrant, we obviously would love to hear that story as well. And so let's kick it off with Sunny. Yes, thank you. I, I migrated here in 1986. I was just a kid. I was 16 years old. I just graduated from high school uh, and coming into college here. Um, didn't know anybody. I was depressed and you know, I didn't have any friends. Um, and the, but my mindset at that time, because my father and my mother have been living here, kind of conditioned me uh, to be, to have a mindset that, hey, um, do well work hard and prove to the people in this country that you belong here. So I took that mindset and that's kind of like how I was in the beginning. Uh, then as I grew more here, I learned that, you know, sometimes no matter how good I try, how, how successful I get or, you know, how much I achieve, there will always be people that will not accept me. And okay, and that's okay with me. You know, it's, I'm, you know I, I try not to be you know, the person for everybody, right? And that's okay. However, then more lately, my views has changed and, and, and it's okay if they don't accept me as long as, okay, we're, we're good. You, there's still respect, but now that things are happening in our community that I'm sure a lot of you have heard of on the AAP hate, hate crimes, then that's when it becomes unacceptable to me when it becomes violent or, or it becomes rude. No, but if, if I may, I, I, we, just we just finished our scholarship luncheon, and I'm more worried sometimes about our children. One of the graduating kids' speech today, he was lost as an AAPI growing up here. He was born. And I just loved how he was so honest when he said, I was ashamed to be Indian in the beginning. And I didn't speak Indian. I, 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 act, I cannot say the words. But later on in life, he realized that being Indian or being Asian is what really made him and what made him successful. 
And I was so touched when he shared that with everybody. So I just wanted to share that with you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Sonny, for, for sharing that story. Uh, Vita, let's hear from you. Sure. Um, I was born in the United States. I was born in San Francisco. My parents immigrated from China. And I can tell you growing up was very um, interesting because when my parents came to San Francisco during that time, Chinese was still really not accepted. We had the Chinese Exclusion Act that's been around for a very long time. So for my parents to come to the United States, it was a very difficult journey. But having my two older brothers who were born in um, China and then my younger brother and younger sister were born in the US like me. Growing up, I learned to adapt. Our family always told us they work hard, stay under the radar, don't cause any trouble, you know, and so forth. But really, I'm an American as much as anyone else, being born here and raised here. And coming to Nevada 26 years ago, one of the biggest reasons why I came to Nevada was because our community, the Asian community, didn't have a voice. When my nephew going to school at eight years old was bullied by his teacher and then bullied by his classmate, they had nowhere their family could go to get help or support. So really, I moved to Las Vegas not only to help the community, but also to handle my, um, so the ne my nephew, long, I had to tell you the story, but, but my nephew was booty, right? But during this whole time, the family was being targeted and threatened, telling them, go back to your country, following them from work, from school, from everywhere, you know, just like, I don't know that threat that they felt, which caused my brother-in-law so much stress that he dies of a heart attack. And he's only 46 years old, leaving his wife, a, a daughter of 11 years old, and my nephew at eight years old. I came here to take care of the funeral arrangement, but I also end up staying because I know our community need more support and help. And you know, 26 years ago, Chinatown wasn't even, the Chinatown was just barely one store, uh, 99 Ranch was open, and that was like the growth of uh, our community. So that's my experience. Uh, of uh, being Asian American. Thank you so much, Vita. Uh, Erica, let's hear your story. Well, thank you, Sunny and Vita, uh, you know, really for sharing those very honest portrayals of, of what your experience was like. And for me, uh, I'm a millennial, right? So I have a different experience in that I was born in the United States in uh, San Diego, California. My dad is full Filipino. He immigrated here when he was 17. My mom is half Filipina. So her mother was born in the Philippines and came here, but her dad was white. Uh, and so I've really had the experience of what I really talk about in our work is the intersectionality of, I am a proud Filipina, but I also grew up uh, low income. So I really experienced what it was like going to Title I schools, going to multiple schools growing up, and actually didn't have a lot of other AAPI classmates, had a lot of Latinx as well as African American Black students with me. And, and that's really how I identified as a BIPOC individual, especially growing up. And so the work that I do and the path that I've taken was a Clark County School District teacher. Uh, I was the first in my family to graduate from college, worked in the superintendent's office, and then started leadership training in 2012 in East Las Vegas, where I was a teacher, because so many students that both looked like me growing up as well as look like me that were my former students, I didn't see them have the equitable access to an education uh, that we know they should have. And so I started leaders in training 10 years ago and we don't have a high AAPI population. We're expanding with the help of uh, Ms. Vita Lynn on here next school year. But something that I think is really important is that what I do is really share my AAPI identity with those that we work with and be an AAPI leader in the space where there are not a lot of people that look like me who are doing the work. So the more that we can learn from each other, I think the further we can go faster. Thank you, Erica and, and Sunny and Vita for sharing your stories. Um, it, these are really important stories. I know for me, um, that Asian identity component has been really important and something that I myself have reflected on these last few years. Um, I, I grew up here in the US, um, but kind of shied away from that. And, you know, growing up, like in my head, it, it almost felt like, you know, I needed to 
to be away from from talking about how I was Asian and, and that culture because it wasn't like cool. Um, and it wasn't until these last couple of years, especially being among um, leaders like these three, where I started to feel a little bit more proud and embrace that side of me. So it's, it's really an honor to be in this great company. So, um, you know, touching on what Sunny said earlier, this is a great segue into our next question. Um, so in the episode of Asian Americans, it talked about the murder of Chinese American Vincent Chin, who was beaten to death in a racially motivated attack in 1982 by white men who mistook him for being Japanese and essentially blamed him for the economic downfall of the auto industry. And so this event in particular started a movement that ignited a push for Asian American rights. And while we have seen great progress in our society over the last few decades. Here we are again today, still facing the same issues with hate crimes and anti-Asian sentiment now as a result of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. So both obviously have inspired movements and empowered Asian Americans to be heard. And can each of you reflect on the significance of these events and how important it is for AAPIs to raise their voices, not just for our own community, but for all communities of color. Um, and I want to start this time with Erica. Yeah, thank you. I just think it's really important. I really think uh, of three things. I think one, and I, I know it's going to come up later, right? Uh, the API experience, we're not all a monolith. And I think that so much, so many people are really trying to understand this idea. There are many of us. We range from many different type of languages, many different type of places. And I think one, just understanding, right? So when you started that question of even people uh, not understanding what's the difference between different cultures, I think is just so important. Uh, but then two, I think this idea that even though it's happening to us right now or, or has happened to us recently, that our experience is not alone. So there are so many other people of color as well that experiences the injustice of systemic racism or structural inequity. And I think until we all can band together of, of how we can talk about systems of oppression, talk about economic inequality and how certain people are scapegoated. And so that's why a lot of these consequences happen. I think when we can get to the nuanced conversations about power, who's in positions of power, who's not, I think we can talk about solutions. But to me, it's as if we have to do the baseline. I think even this Zoom is a great example. We have to do the baseline of understanding uh, that if we don't have people around us who can share it, right? How do we seek it to understand and then to, to figure out how to fix? Wonderful, thanks, Erica. Uh, Vita, let's go to you. Sure, so you mentioned in the 1980s when Vincent Chen, uh, that incident that happened, right? When something like this happened, because the OCA was actually, original name was uh, um, Organization of Chinese American. When, the, when our community gets together to fight an injustice or get our voices heard, this is what we need to do as a community. And in Las Vegas, we have, according to the, the American uh, Community Survey that's based with the census, we have over three, in 2019, we have over 343,000 Asians in Clark County alone. And people who's been in Las Vegas for, the, for me for the 26 years, you can see Spring Mountain, the business that's been popping up and, and what the, the change of our community. But education and educating our community, we still have a long way to go. We have, struggle for so long. Why does it happen that I had to move to Las Vegas 26 years ago and it took me 20 years to open the Asian Community Development Council, ACDC, to do more straight advocacy work and service for our community. One of the things I know what we did in 2015, we start doing voter registration. When we register our community, that's when we have a voice. And I think we've been so quiet for so long because when in the past it goes, well, I don't want to vote because it's too political, or I don't want to get involved because I don't know the issue, or I don't want to get involved because we were taught to stay under the radar. So getting our community to come out to register, give them to vote, and it's nonpartisan, we don't tell who to vote, we just want them to have a voice, right? So in 2016, we registered over uh, 3,100 people to get, um, to get our community in, uh, out there, right? But in 2018, 
when we work with people of color, bring everyone together and collaborate, we register over 14,400. Now that's just ACDC. That also means that me for me, I vote and all the other groups coming together, we register over 100,000. But when our community vote, when our community gets involved, we have a voice. When issues like this happen, this anti-Asian hate crime, if we didn't register the people, if we didn't get people, our community together and let the elected official and everybody else know that we exist. When the anti-Asian hate crime came, most of the elected officials reached out to us and say, what can we do to help? That's the difference between when I moved out here 26 years ago. Companies will call me and say, what can we do to help? How can we build awareness in our workplace? How can we build awareness in the community? So we have to start thinking about what is issue and how can we get together? So one of the things that we are doing right now is trying to do the language hotline, language bank hotline. I always forget how we term that. And we recently got one large grant from the SAN Corporation, which the announcement you probably see is already uh, sent, the press release went out today. But it's companies that comes together to see what we can do to make the change and what we can do to make the difference. So this is time where we kind of get everyone together, know that we exist, and racism is not tolerated at all. It shouldn't be tolerated, I don't care. If it's Asian race, any racism should not be tolerated. And, it's, and I keep reminding people, someone said to me, racism is un-American. It really isn't. The United States is built of immigrants and, and people, foreigners and people coming to this country to build this country. We should have more education to educate our community. Why the Chinese and the Filipino back in the days help build the railroad in the Sierra mountain. So these are stories that we have to talk about, but also teach in school. So they know how much the Asian has contributed to this country. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you, Vita. Sunny, we'll go to you. All right, uh, to me, that incident is a reminder um, that we have, that although we have progressed, we still have a long way to go. It seems like every time we move forward, we fall two steps back. Whenever something comes up, that's kind of like uh, racially motivated, right? Or it's an incident. Um, it seems to me like it's still lurking. That negative racial tone is still lurking, just sleeping and waiting for an incident to happen. And then it comes out again. I mean, just last week or a week and a half ago, we have a Filipino custodian in one of the casinos here in town. One of the patrons, threw garbage at him and told him that this is who you are, you're garbage. Go back to where you belong to. And this Filipino man didn't know what to do. He didn't know that if he fights back, if he fights back, will he lose his job? Um, he, st he started thinking about his kids. If I'm getting this here, what are my kids going through in school? So there's still a lot of things that we need to learn. Vita's right, and congratulations on that grant. We need to, uh, for the hotline, but we need uh, to also do education. That's what we're trying to do with in our chamber. We're trying to reach out to other corporations. We're trying to educate them through their diversity and inclusion council about AAPI. We're hoping that the more people learn about what we do, how we contribute, the better they understand who we are. And we are just regular people like everybody else trying to make it in this country. But the one thing that we are asking for from all the corporations that we're speaking to now is a zero, a zero tolerance policy on hate crimes against anybody, pretty much. Because think of, put yourself in the shoes of that Filipino man. He was so scared to fight back because he might lose his job. He didn't know if his company had his back or not. And that's hard because nobody should ever be subjected to that kind of treatment. But if they know that they are backed by their employer, then it would make a big difference for them. Uh, and the other thing too would be the bystanders, right? We've always asked for people help out. Uh, we, we cannot just be a bystander and not do anything. The, the video that, that's very popular about the Filipino woman being beaten up by a man, 64 year old woman being beaten up by a man in New York, when there were three guys standing around doing nothing. And that's unacceptable. They need to say something or stop it. So um, thank you. 
Thank you, Sunny. Yeah, and, and you know, at OCA, we, we too are, are helping to spread the word on, on the importance of, of speaking up and um, and taking action, right? As, as they've all uh, alluded to, it, it's not okay to be a bystander and there's so many different ways we can help. And, and one of those ways is taking action and, and speaking up um, for the AAPI community and, and anyone who is experiencing um, uh, hate or, or racism. So thank you all for, for sharing your thoughts. Um, so for this next question, I, I want to share this quote from the docu-series that I thought was really great. Um, one of the interviewees said, the very idea that the Asian American contains within itself an endless range of possibilities is a part of who we are. The Asian American story is such a quintessential American story because we as Asian Americans have represented the polar extremes of the American experience. And so in that docu-series, we heard about the struggles of AAPIs, right, as well as the hard work and the grit of them, and even the contributions of immigrants. So now we're seeing a lot more influential Asians in media, in business, out in the community, such as yourselves. Do you all have stories or, or influential people in, in the Asian community who have inspired you personally to get you where you are? Um, and Sunny, we can start with you on that. Well, as, as far as my inspiration, um, not a leader, it's, I'll give you two. So the first one would be my father. And, and the reason why I love my, and he inspires me so much is he, he, his, his vision of us being able to come here using a benefit that he had because he fought with the US Army in World War II. And if you do that, you, you can automatically apply for US um, you know, to live here basically. And, but he had that vision, even though he was doing pretty well in the country, that this is the country to be in. It's a great country to live in. The future is here. And, and he was 100% right. And uh, he was a brilliant man. And he also taught me about working hard and, um, and really showing people, before you can speak up, show people what you can do and, and be good. And, and so I, I've always appreciated that. That's always in the back of my mind whenever I make a decision or I do something. But the other person would be, um, and, and a lot of you probably know her, is Gloria Kawili. You know, a lot of us learn, uh, a lot of us become who we are because of our experiences. And I, I don't want to speak for her, but the experiences that she had uh, really taught her how to, why it's so important to be able to speak up and fight for other people. And I truly admire that. And it inspires me when, whenever I do something every day. Am I helping out somebody? Am I helping my fellow person or my, my, anybody that I can help with to, to be better, to uplift the community? So those two people would be the ones for me. Thank you. Thank you, Sunny. Uh, Erica, let's go to you. Yeah, so when I really think about my parents' experience, I think what's really important if you are uh, a first-generation American, right, my dad's experience in the world is just so different from mine. Um, I went to college, I went to graduate school, he has a GED, he's the hardest working person I know, uh, he's the reason why I'm very smart, him and my mom, but you know, he works at night still, He work, he's hourly, my mom is a secretary, right, they are essential workers, and I live in this world of privilege where I can order my groceries on Amazon, but really ha get to see every day the experience of real people, you know, just trying to make it in this country. And so it's really important for me to stay grounded in who I am in that background, because that propels me to do the work that I do, because everybody should be able to have a livable wage to, to be able to pursue their dreams in the way they want. So it's really them. And then I think of our students and families that you know, my students will say you're the first API teacher I've ever had, right? I think that's ludicrous uh, in today's age. Or people will come up to me and say, I've never met a, a API founder of, of a nonprofit, right? That's why when I met Vita and when I met Yui, they really helped me and, and took me under their wing as well. That was really helpful. But I think that we have gone so far and that we at least talk about these issues. But there, as you know, there's so much so much more to go when we talk about who's funded in philanthropy, when we talk about who are leaders in positions of power, who can make these decisions around uh, supporting staffs and in corporations so much easier if they've had the experiences. So for me, I'm really inspired by the people in the work, the people uh, on this call right now, and, and just really excited because I think when our younger generation who are very 
I think, open to identity, very open to, to difference, uh, take the mantle of leadership, I think that we'll see a lot of change. Absolutely. Thank you, Erica. Vita? Oh, you're currently on mute, Vita. Okay. This whole, sorry. So I'm glad I was the last one you picked because I had to think. And I had so many mentors in my life and so many people have taught me in every step of the way, right? As a child, my father was a great um, uh, mentor because he was working as a dishwasher in one of the places in San Francisco back in the days. And they treated, um, again, they treated Chinese like a second class citizen. And I'm telling you, I'm showing my age. I know I was born in, in the 1950s. So we're talking about in the 50s where life was quite different. Um, but when he, when he got fired as a dishwasher, he would have to come home to his wife and five kids, you know, and, and tell my mom, like, you know, I don't have a job. But what he, I mean, he said to the person that fired him was, one day I will have my own restaurant and my own business. But then he went back to the community because in San Francisco, we have a community center from people who came from China would go to, to do a translation with uh, letters that they get or English or sending money back home or whatever they did. So what they did as a community, they all band together and lend him money or raise money for him, lend him money to start his first business. And from that business, one coffee shop and then later on we evolved to other businesses. This is what happens when you support and help each other. And I remember working in the restaurant, we're really busy and he said to me one day and he said, it's really important to remember to thank those, like the dishwasher there or anybody else that's working there. It was a busy day to thank them for helping or even though they're getting paid, but make them feel that they appreciate, make them feel like family. Or my mother who gives me strength where a, a person came into the restaurant and pulled a gun on her and say, I want this apple pie. And she goes, no, you have to pay 15 cents. I'm not gonna give you this apple pie. And she stood her ground and I'm like, I was only what, eight years old. I'm like, what is going on? I'm trying to go out there and intervene. But my father stopped and goes, don't escalate any issues. Let things handle. She's doing fine because her, the way she carried herself was that strength that she had. So, so my father teach me how to be kind, kind to people. My mother teach me how to be strong and strength. And if something doesn't go your way, what do you do to change the dynamic, right? And coming to Las Vegas with the whole incident with the Asian uh, uh, not getting support and so forth, it took me a while, but it helps build where I am today, an organization that we can help others to give them that support. And Sunny mentioned, Gloria, Gloria Caridi, yes. She taught me how to do voter registration, how to get the uh, people engaged. I had Tim Wong, who's a, own a company called Arcadia, who taught me like business and business how to support and so forth. I can't even name because I know there's so many people I'm gonna forget, but too many mentors, but every mentor that taught me to where we are today, I we are thankful for them. And being able to do this job that I'm doing now to help the community is, uh, I'm very thankful for all the hundreds of mentors that have mentored me. Thank you, Vita, and thank you to all three of you. I know I, I know the three of you serve as, as really amazing mentors to a lot of uh, people here in the community, um, and your stories certainly resonate. I know for me, um, my family who, who came from the Philippines um, are, are certainly inspiring, but I know growing up, um, something super impactful for me was, was watching media, and, and I was so immersed in pop culture where we didn't really see a lot of people like ourselves on TV, and here we are, right? We, we saw Parasite winning. Oscars and you have Minari and you have um, BTS kind of taking the world by storm in the music industry and so all of that is incredibly life-changing I know for myself um, seeing these people in media it, in my head I'm like that's that's amazing I like it's so cool that these people can be at the forefront of of our, our pop culture but I think the shame in that is us growing up and thinking that it's normal to not see that um, but I think in this in these couple of years for the next generation and for young people, I think it's incredibly life-changing for them to see role models on TV and, and in movies and in music and, and to know that, that it is possible to reach that, um, those accomplishments. So thank you all for, for sharing your stories as well. 
Um, so I want to go to this next question. So we, we've talked about the growth of AAPIs here in Southern Nevada, um, you know, not just in population, but so many different businesses. There's a lot of food culture here. Can, can each of you talk about the progress of the Asian community that you all have seen during your time here and, and how you think it's helped uh, bring the community closer together? Um, with this question, let's start with Vita. Um, thank you. So one of the things when you talk about food, which is my favorite subject, and I think that one thing about food, we bring people together when it comes to food. That's a common, when we talk about food or have food or eat food together is great. So OCA, which is, uh, Nicole, you know, in 2019, we, no, 2018, we decided to do an Asian night market. What was better than have an Asian night market with local businesses, with Asian food, and bring the community out, right? So it's free of charge. Let's get the community to come out. Let's help the small businesses, the, the uh, brew tea with the bubble tea or the matcha with the soft syrup ice cream and um, district one and all these wonderful businesses. Let's bring them to the parking lot and let's have an event. And when I met with the president of San Martin Hospital, he goes, well, it would be great. Let me give you my parking lot space. How many people do you expect to show up? I said. Oh, it's our first year, maybe 500 to 1,000. We had over 7,000 people showed up in that parking lot. There was no place to park. There was, you couldn't even walk. It was, so, it was so tight. In fact, someone told me, it reminds me of uh, Japan during the rush hour in the subway. And they was very polite to each other, but we like packed like sardines. But bringing food together and, and having uh, that stage to talk about what's important. In that time, we were pushing out the census and getting our community to fill out the census because that comes every 10 years. But our community thought the census was something like, oh, the census to control us. Like, no, census takes data of how much money we need to bring into our state to help with the infrastructure, with building the roads, with the schools uh, and the hospitals and so forth, right? And we had to explain to them 1,200 per year per person. In 10 years, that's 12,500 that comes to our state per person to help with these support, right? So that educational piece by having food, by bringing everyone together, that's how we get the message out. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and, and at OCA, we, we've loved putting on this event uh, with Vita, and, and really, it's just amazing how many people came out for that. And, and hopefully, we'll be able to do this uh, uh, sooner than later. Again, unfortunately, we haven't been able to due to the pandemic, but um, I definitely look out for more information in the near future for it. Uh, Erica, let's go to you. Yeah, thank you. I think being agnostic of party, but also, you know, showing that the API experience, again, right, race is a social construction, everybody, we all fall in different places uh, of the political spectrum. But um, again, agnostic of party, I think just one example is we have a caucus now in the, the Nevada State Legislature. So I think even thinking about that, that that didn't exist before in a place that's third highest of API in the country, I think those are just examples of we do not have power political representation if this is the first year we actually have multiple people part of part of a caucus. Absolutely. Um, and, and Sunny, um, I know you you work with a lot of uh, businesses that come here in town. Can you talk about uh, how that has grown and, and been impacted here in Southern Nevada? Oh, yeah, definitely. So and then not only that, we we're well, we are the fastest my growing minority here in Nevada, but I just want to know that we are also a very great contributor to the society. So uh, there are over 22,000, actually over 21,000, close to 22,000 small business Asian owned now. And what does that mean? That provides revenue to our state through their fees, through their taxes. They are also employers. So they are job creators. Uh, as far as our community, uh, uh, kids have excellent graduation rates. Uh, low arrest rates, uh, high median income, uh, high home ownership, all of that contributes to our society. Uh, we are in diverse industries. Um, we talk about saving grace for Nevada. We have a short, a national shortage of nurses. Uh, Filipino nurses are, uh, are, uh, are coming in here in droves and 20% of our healthcare people are AAPI. Um, without them, we'd be in trouble. Nobody will be taking care of our people, especially in this pandemic. Same thing with education. 
over the last four years, we've recruited over 400 special ed teachers from the Philippines alone. Uh, so again, uh, that's contribution that I hope people would understand how good this community has been helping. Uh, they are frontliners to this pandemic. Um, now, we are very diverse, uh, like I, I believe Erica both and Vita said, and even you, Nicole, there are 48 different countries and 13 islands, I believe, under the Asian ethnicity. So that, and that is a lot of diversity, but all of them do contribute. And as far as business is concerned, there's still a lot moving here from California. So you can see uh, some of the ones that are opening in, uh, and if, it, then all the names escape me, but a lot of the restaurants that are opening in the Shanghai Plaza town originated from California. Now they're coming over here. Uh, 85 degrees, my favorite. So that's one, but I, I couldn't wait for them to open here because I used to go there a lot when I was living in California. So there you go, thank you. Thank you, Sunny. And, and yeah, you, you touched mm -hmm. on that diversity aspect um, a little bit, which is a segue into our next question, right? So as, as mentioned, I think something that people often do is group Asians into just this one category, but in reality, as you've mentioned, I mean, this group is incredibly diverse. So um, I know Erica brought this up earlier. Can, can you start and, and talk about why it's important for us to showcase this diversity and, and talk about that? Yeah, thank you. I'll just use one example that I think is so uh, important in our own work, right? We know that we can, we know that there are certain ethnicities when it comes to the API, right? And if we take out the PI and Pacific Islander, or if we look at other racial groups, we can see the differences in education, right? So we have this model minority myth of what everybody thinks the Asian experience is, but if you actually look at it by subgroup categories, we can see that some of the different groups aren't performing as high. And when we can actually see that, we can measure that, we can do something about it. We can differentiate instruction. Uh, AAPI students are still English language learners. AAPI individuals are still undocumented. And I think until we look at each subgroup and look at certain people, just if we look at the census, are higher income than others, then we can be differentiated in the way that we support um, all of our communities. Absolutely, thank you, Erica. Vita, let's go to you on that question. I'm sorry, yeah, to run that question back to me one more time. Sure, sure. So um, why is it important for us to showcase the diversity of AAPIs and, and essentially show that we're not all the same and, and not a, a monolith? Sure. So in our um, staffing, we have um, bilingual staff, right? So we have someone who speaks Chinese, we have someone who speaks Korean, someone who speaks Vietnamese, and I can go on, right? So we have the seven top. When we have the language skill during the whole pandemic, one of the things that they did was the governor reached out to us and said, can you translate this in different languages? Because like Sunny said, there's over 40, but let's get the top, you know, the top seven, right? Because we, we we there forever trying to get all 40, right? So the top seven, so we translate what was essential worker, what was not essential worker, right? Or when the schools got started, the, the public school came to us and said, can you translate that it's going to be done virtually and how they can get the Chromebook? and how they can get the um, what Cox with the um, internet so the kids can do school at home. So having this um, thinking that, oh, this uh, go to the to an Asian group and let's have these translation in all these languages and, and it'd be easy to say, no, it's very difficult. And they say, oh, we can go on Google and do the translation, but I can tell you, we know that the translation in Google is not that great. It, um, we have to kind of proofread what we, uh, sent right and then there's different dialects right so it goes on and on and on but without the language without being able to uh let people understand that we don't speak the language same language and it comes to something as simple as food we have a food pantry because of what happened with the pandemic but our food pantry is different because it's catered to the different ethnic group so when it comes to the chinese all food is a little different than korean the Korean rice, even talk about rice and Lebanese rice, everybody, even when it comes to rice, as simple as rice, there's different type for different families, right? So when they think that, oh, if we help this one group, we'll help them all. It's like, no, we have to then, when you help an, an Asian group, like that, maybe Sunny's group or our uh, group, we then have to divide it into subgroup to help our community to do languages and translation and food and so forth. And Erica's right. Everything's, oh, Asians are all rich. 
you, you know, if we don't have a tree in the backyard that grows money. I mean, I don't know where they even came with that idea. Or we're all smart when it comes to education. It is not so. But when you're the modern minority, people think that we don't need any help or we don't need any service. And when I used to go to ask for funding for our community, they, they were always surprised to say, I didn't think the Asian needs money or I didn't think Asian have issues. And I can tell you, when we did over 5,000 food pantry, uh, 5,000 food for families, we know there's a need. And there's so many families that we did not help during, uh, that we're still trying to help. So that, that's when that moral minority myth is really uh, um, against us. Thank you for sharing that, Vita, and um, but certainly a lot of hard work from your team. I know doing translations in itself is, is such a, a tedious process and takes a lot of time, so we really appreciate you doing that. Um, Sunny, do you want to add final thoughts in this uh, diversity component? Yes. So there's two things that, that, that really sticks when I saw this question that really stand out to me. The first one is, look, there's really not a perfect culture or diversity out there. Uh, and, and I always tell my kids, you're living here, but don't forget your culture. Because when you get the best of different cultures, you're a better, more well-rounded person. You understand better, you adapt to different diverse, uh, to a diversity a lot easier, you adapt easier. Uh, all, all companies now, almost, not all, but almost companies now have their own diversity and inclusion group. Okay, get a nation in there. You know why? They're very adept to it. I mean, a Filipino alone, they're, it, we have so many different dialects and different islands in the Philippines. We have to be, we, we have so much diversity in our own one country. Uh, and then as far as language is concerned, I have to agree uh, as, as a chamber, one of the things that we did during COVID is to help out with the PPP loans. And when it comes to translation, the reason why that's so important, translating a piece of paper to a one pager doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't mean that they'll understand exactly how it works already just by translating an application form or instructions into Chinese or Filipino. There's more to that. You actually have to sit down and explain it to them. So when halfway through the PPP application forms, I, 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 I observed that not a lot of Asian businesses were taking advantage of this resource for them. And they're the ones that really need it. They were hit badly. So I started doing webinars, let's say with the Vietnamese community, with the Thai community, Korean, Chinese, with somebody that they trusted. And when I did that, it opened it up. And I, I cannot tell you, my whole team, we probably helped over 500 smaller businesses doing PPP ourselves. And that's going through the whole process. And I wish I had more resources because we're really strapped. I only have uh, Chinese and Japanese in my staff that can help. I'm, I'm Filipino, I'm the third. I had to ask, I had to beg people for uh, help to help me translate in Vietnamese, Thai, and, and different organizations or, or different languages, just in order for us to be able to help these people. So it's, it's a, we need to showcase because we need to let people understand that we need more resources, we need help. And it's also a good thing. It's a positive about being diverse. Thank you. Absolutely, and, and thank you for, for all the work that your team has done, Sunny. Um, and so for this next question, uh, the episode mentioned that we are living in a more global world, but also still very divided, right? So I wanna ask all of you the question posed by this documentary, how do we as a nation and community move forward together? Um, and so let's start with Vita on that. How to move forward? Wow. Um, well, first of all, we need to accept that we live in global time. Uh, one thing that we, we're adapting right now because of the pandemic is how to do things virtually, which helps a lot. So I can communicate somewhere that's in, in Asia or someone that, you know, so doing that training, learning, and also accepting that it's okay that we live in a, in a different time and, and we have to live things uh, in a global world and how do we come together, right? But what we need to do, the biggest thing we need to do is to come together and not divide. Don't point finger at this country. But no, the better, we should set an example in the United States of how to bring people together, right? Because this country is so diverse with the different uh, uh, languages and different um, races and so forth. And that's a positive thing. It's not a negative thing. It's a positive thing, right? 
So if we can prove that we're strong as American working together, we will always be strong and accept that global as a plus and in, accept everybody has something special, right? When we work with different groups here, even in Las Vegas, when I work with lit, leaders in training, they specialize in what they specialize. Or I work with OCA, with the Asian night market doing uh, events together. Or we work with Sunny and say, hey, when it comes to business side, they handle the business, let us handle the community. So us coming together, working with different groups, we do a thing what we call Give in May, which is this month. And we pick eight different uh, organizations to help them build uh, funding and capacity. One of them is called Bamboo Bridges, who's been around for 12 years, who helps uh, victims of domestic violence in the Asian community, right? And they've always struggled because they don't have funding to do more service and more work. We support the Ninth Island Anti, who help feed the homeless during the, um, uh, for the API community, for the uh, Hawaiian Pacific community, actually. And we support them. So when we come together and reach out to the different groups here, this is what we call being more global, right? In ourselves and send a good example to others. Absolutely, thank you, Vita. Erica, let's go to you on that. Yeah, it's a great big question, right? I think uh, as said before, but to me, I think it's really about education. I was there when to testify on the current Nevada legislator, legislative bill that has inclusion for uh, multicultural education as well as education about LG, the LGBT, LGBTQ plus uh, identity and really understanding that this is should be where we are, right? It's acceptable, it should be where we teach our students. And if we wanna to come together, we need everyone to understand difference, but also just know each other's histories. I mean, I'm a little embarrassed to say, but I watched that episode and said, oh, I do not know about all of this stuff and it's my own history. And if I don't know it, and I was a teacher and I work with young people, I also know many of them don't know it. And that's how we can get into the stereotypes and biases that we have. So to me, I think we need to start young and early. And for everyone on the call, right, if you're even thinking of a call to action, it's how to support things like that. Of Because there was a lot of pushback when I was there testifying that people didn't want that, that they didn't want multicultural education uh, in our schools. I think that's just one very specific example. Thank you, Erica. And, and yeah, I mean, just like you, I watched that episode as well and, and had no idea about most of the things that happened there. And, and they're things that I, I just never knew or, or never learned growing up. So I appreciate you sharing that um, as well. Uh, Sunny, uh, what about you? Well, for me, it's for us to build cultural unity. And what that is, is, okay, we are all living in this space now, right? All of us come from different backgrounds, different cultures. That's fine. We respect each other. We respect each other's culture, but now we have to build cultural unity, our own culture living together. And that's really built on respect with one another, living how to live with one another and knowing what, what makes another person tick or what makes them go versus, and, and, and not do that, right? Uh, it's all about building that and we should be able to live with another in one area. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you, Sunny. Um, and so as we wrap up, we wanna take a minute for, for some final thoughts from each of our speakers. And while they do share these thoughts, um, I know we wanna encourage everyone here to, I believe, use the annotate feature. Is that on, correct, Janet? Um, so there is an annotate feature here uh, in, in the Zoom, um, if you'd like to use it uh, while our panelists are answering the same question. Um, so, for everyone and specifically for our panelists, what's the biggest thing that you hope Southern Nevadans take away from AAPI Heritage Month? And then also, can you tell us uh, how can we learn more or get involved with your organization? And so let's start with uh, Sunny on that. So for me, it's just about learning about the AAPI culture. So at the, learn it take a look at it and see how we've contributed to the society, to this community. And, and hopefully with that, you know, I really believe in that saying, show me. And if I show you what we've done, then hopefully you'll accept us, right? You'll accept me and, 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 and treat me as your equal. Now, if that doesn't work, then that's another issue <laughs> because sometimes it doesn't. But that's what I hope to get to gain from this. I want that educational part of who we are 
and, and why we're here, um, what we contribute and how we can exist together. Thank you. Great, and, and Sunny, for those who are um, looking to learn more, what is your website that we can go to? Oh yes, sorry about that. It's lbacc.com or .org, sorry, .org, uh, uh, lbacc.org. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Erica, let's go to you. So my hope would really be that when we think about this month, as well as all the months that celebrate the BIPOC or different identities, uh, that systemic racism and structural inequity are, are real things that we live in, uh, and that the model minority myth is was actually created to divide people. So I know so many people think it's a, it's a positive thing, but as we talked about before, it can really hurt communities when we lump everyone together or when we elevate one group over another group to make excuses for inequity. So I hope that people just uh, remember that. I think this is the group, right, that knows that. That's why they're on this group. But the more we can share that with everyone will be great. And our organization is at litlv.org. And we'd love your support in any way. I'll put it in the chat. Perfect. Thank you so much, Erica and Vita. So when we talk about Asia's Heritage Month, we only talk about the month, but you're right, Erica. It's not only one month, it's all year round. Let's embrace each other, let's support each other. I love the idea of building allies. And I'm not talking only with the Asian group, but with everyone, right? When we build these allies, when we come together, that's when we can really do something, right? But to also not to find that we're an enemy. We have contributed so much to this country for so long. And, and you know, just remember that, right? So Let's continue and let's support some of these nonprofits. Every nonprofit out here, uh, with Erica's group, with, even with the chamber, we count on support from the community. We count from support from corporation, from foundations, from every walk, so we can continue doing these service to help the community as a whole. So make sure you, um, one thing I know that I have taught myself in everything I've done, and when I talk to other students or things. The most important things to remember is to give back. And I was on the, on the um, speaking engagement at Zappo, and I talked about Tony Shea, what his vision was, right? He invested so much, 350 million into downtown, into the community. And that's what we want to do too. Build and do well. This is a country of opportunity, but always remember to give back. And I think with ACDC, my thing is to try to give back to the community as much as possible. Because I love being in the United States. My family love being here. We all, it was hard, it was struggle, it was never easy. But these journey that we have, these bumps that we have in the road makes us stronger and make us do better, right? But always remember to give back. And our website is www.acdc. And if you don't put the envy after that, you'll get the rock group. So make sure it's www.acdcnv.org. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Vita. Um, and, and on behalf of OCA, um, you know, this year we, we've definitely uh, been trying hard to raise awareness on, on the same issues that everyone here has been um, uh, trying to talk about. Um, with the Stop Asian Hate Movement, we did uh, create a webpage on our site it's ocalasvegas.org slash stop Asian hate. Um, you know, I, and I'm sure the other three can attest to this. What we were realizing is there were a lot of people approaching us and saying, how can we help? We don't even know where to start, right? So um, we wanted to put some resources together um, to, to let people know how they can support and be an ally. And, you know, as Vita said, you can donate to uh, organizations that are focused on advocating for the community. Um, and then we also have graphics that can be shared um, that talks about how you can be an ally, right? Just supporting people uh, in the API community, speaking up, educating them, reaching out, supporting local businesses, et cetera. So definitely check um, our website out there. Um, and with that, I wanna thank our three speakers here today for sharing your really important 
important and valuable insights and experiences with us today. And we appreciate everyone who's joined us and, and thank you to United Way for having us today. Um, and on behalf of uh, all of us here, have a wonderful AAPI Heritage Month. And with that, I will pass it back to Aubrey. Sorry about that, had some technical difficulties. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you to our panelists, you guys have been amazing. Thank you for sharing your stories. I myself have learned so much about the API community in our, our own community. Thank you for sharing your insight, resources and stories. It was an amazing panel. Thank you, Nicole, for moderating, you were amazing. And I hope you guys can continue the conversation on Twitter. Um, the link is in the chat box. If you guys wanna share what you learned during the panel, we would truly appreciate it. And we'll be posting on our social media about the panel later today. Thank you so much. Thank you.